Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, I guess now. Uh, however, for those of you who are going to see this in a recorded format, uh, it is good to be with you. My name is Dr. Juan Acuña. I am an obstetrician, gynecologist, and geneticist, and epidemiologist working at Halifa University as the chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health, and also the assistant dean for research. I am also the research director for SAHA and the chair for the National Committee for Epidemiological Research on COVID-19 uh, out from the Ministry of Health and the Department of Health in Abu Dhabi. Um, what I am going to cover today is a, a very a short and concise presentation, not on scientific information behind the COVID-19 vaccine, but more on practical aspects of the COVID-19 vaccine on the questions that people always wanted to ask. Uh, I hope that I have covered more and most uh, than those that you have and those that you have asked, but uh, they are based on the experience of having to handle uh, many interactions during the pandemic. So I just compiled them and I think that I am going to be covering uh, the topic quite uh, swiftly and completely. However, if you have questions that are not covered by my presentation, you can do two things. Number one is there are other more technical presentations about the vaccine for COVID-19 uh, by my peers. And I will uh, present a brief slide on those to you so you can have it there and you can consult later. Those are available or will be available as they come along in YouTube as this one is. And second, uh, if all the questions arise, please um, uh, type them during the presentation and then we will try our best to communicate to you the answers. So now I am going to share my screen and I will start my presentation. Okay, so uh, my presentation, as I mentioned to you, is entitled uh, The Questions You Wanted to Ask and Perhaps Never Did About COVID-19. And it's fundamentally based on the fact that since February 29th, where in the UAE we had our first case, um, basically we can say that that was the last day of the rest of our lives because uh, life with COVID-19 has changed dramatically, not only for us, but globally. And second, what is very important is that in all aspects, many experts have said, not until we get a vaccine, will we return to somehow that, that we would consider normal before the pandemic. So basically, the main question is, will the vaccines stop the pandemic? And I would like you to try to answer these based on your own knowledge, uh, whether it is uh, true or whether it is false. And um, you will make your own conclusions at the end of this presentation, all together with the information that I said, as I mentioned, that you can find in the other uh, winter series webinars that Halifa University has put together for you uh, during these past weeks and the next uh, few weeks, uh, as I believe. So these are the four topics that are going to be covered for the vaccine and COVID-19. And I hope that you can have some time to review them and, and enjoy them and use them uh, for your general and particular knowledge. Uh, these are the most important questions that I was able to, to um, summarize and they talk about different aspects of the vaccine. The first one is why do we need a vaccine and whether there is misinformation with respect to the vaccine, the vaccine processes and all the aspects that I will cover. The second one is why different types. Third one uh, about vaccine development. Uh, why was it so fast? Uh, fourth one, why should I get vaccinated? Then there will be questions about safety and effectiveness of the vaccines. Um, the fact of uh, when can I get the vaccine now or why can I not get mine now? Uh, um, another question, um, if I got COVID-19, 
doesn't it mean that I already have immunity, so should I get the vaccine or not? Um, will I be immune if I get the vaccine? How long will the immunity last if I get any? Uh, will I need to vaccinate again? And if so, when do I need to do so? And finally, should I keep using PPE and uh, probably other measures uh, such as quarantine and isolation? And if so, why? So let's dive into our questions. Uh, the first is why vaccine? And you can see in the first picture that the world definitely changed. And this is a subway uh, car in New York City right now in peak hour. Uh, these cars before the pandemic, you could not fit one more person in a subway car in New York City. However, now they are mostly empty. So definitely the world is a different one and you can see many aspects of it. Uh, but going back into why do we need a vaccine or why do we need to develop or why have we emphasized so much in the development of vaccines, we have historical data that supports the vaccines since the first semi-accidental discovery that uh, well, inoculating people with the uh, that were sick from um, uh, disease of uh, cows, they would get immune to get that disease later. So we have historical data, not only from those uh, times, but modern times where, as you can see in the curve, when we started vaccinating for smallpox, and that is the same history for many of the other diseases, we were able to decrease the number of cases until in the case of smallpox, we were able to eradicate it uh, from uh, globally. However, what we know is that each one of the infectious agents that produce each one of these infectious diseases has different behaviors. They are of different nucleic acid, uh, RNA and DNA. They behave very, very differently and they have different characteristics that made some of them suitable for vaccines uh, and once you vaccinate, you can get a really good management of the disease, such as some uh, smallpox, that is, that is like the example par excellence. However, there are some other diseases like, for instance, HIV AIDS that have been quite elusive to the vaccination or the development of the vaccine process. So in any case, if we can develop a vaccine and the vaccine proves to be uh, to work, uh, we are, are in a good circumstance because it allows us to control the disease. Uh, is there misinformation? Why a vaccine? So, yes, there is a lot of misinformation. So you have heard a very weird history or stories about uh, that if you get an RNA-based vaccine, you're going to be growing some extra body parts or stuff like that. So. Uh, there, there is all sorts of conspiracy theories, uh, and I want to just call your attention to a few ones that are of practical nature, because, of course, if you get any of these vaccines, you will neither get the, the disease, you will not get COVID-19, nor you're going to start, uh, you know, uh, working out your DNA weird ways so that you would have genetic changes and, and things like that. So those are easy, quite easy to get rid of. Uh, unfortunately, there are others that are also there and that are very dangerous for you and your wallet, especially when people use the need for the vaccine and the amp and the excitement about the development of the vaccine and they rob you. So most of these vaccination projects and programs are dealt with or through the governments today. They are quite uh, seriously and closely scrutinized. So, so be very careful when you get emails uh, selling you spots to get the vaccine or asking you to buy vaccine doses that you can get over the mail and get some nurse to administer them to you because that is not the ways that this works. Also, the conspiracy theory that all of these comes from, uh, you know, Bill Gates chip and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So do not trust this information. There are good sites 
such as the US NIH and CDC sites and the global WHO sites, where you can just Google uh, misinformation COVID-19 vaccine and you will get to many places uh, that, that uh, will give you accurate and collated and queried information that will work for you. And, and just as a personal example that I want to communicate to you, I, I was very concerned by these physician bloggers that use uh, bloggers that use their physicianship and their physician title to buy in into people's minds and just give opinions that are completely misleading. So just because the opinion comes from a physician does not mean that is the right one. I commented in one of these blogs that was not only substantially a, a set of misinformation, but was completely wrong and dangerous. And the private, of course, response from this uh, physician blogger was that it was not for him about the information or misinformation, that it was all about the ratings, that his mode of life and his major income was from the ratings that he would get and that controversial, albeit true opinions such as mine, would bring more ratings, so he would welcome controversy motivated by misinformation in his blog site. And there are many like these. So be very careful with those. Uh, are there different types and why are there different types of vaccine? So most of the times uh, for an infectious diseases in, in, in steady times, not in pandemic times, not in outbreak times, uh, the, the interest of developing the vaccine comes from only a few pharmaceutical uh, houses and a few governments or a few institutions, governmental institutions, and then just go pace by pace trying to get into whatever they have developed that will help produce a vaccine. And that's why we, at the end, end up with maybe one or maybe two types of vaccines. As you see in this nature paper that I uh, put there in my slide, this has not been the situation for COVID-19. So in COVID-19, we have gotten many people globally with different technologies or different techniques uh, studied for many years uh, compete to develop the vaccine on parallel fashion and many, many interested in doing so. So basically we can summarize that the vaccines that we have now available that are being distributed globally are made are of viral vectors, of messenger RNA technology, and of protein particles. So you will probably in the uh, other presentations will have the opportunity to learn more about each one of these techniques. So um, the only thing that I'm going to tell you is that there are different uh, types of vaccines, but the information so far have determined that they are both, number one, mostly safe, and number two, uh, they are uh, mostly effective. And I will explain that in answering all the questions. Uh, but this is one of the important points that I want to bring. So as you see in the cartoon, uh, early in the pandemic, and we're talking March, April, uh, when when scientific community asked the world, what do you want? The first priority was then, because of the number of cases and the number of people dying rapidly, was we want treatment. Uh, but treatment became very, very elusive. It's not easy to develop a treatment drug for a virus. So uh, basically then the second option was we need a vaccine. And this cartoon exemplifies what happened mostly in the world. So. Uh, what do we want? We want a vaccine. So it was the worldwide clamor. Uh, when do we want it? And everybody said, we want it now. We want it as soon as possible. And then people, they, they work very hard and invested a lot of money. And they say, well, it is ready. And then people say, well, we don't trust it. It was too fast. So it is very, very, very weird how people react to a lot of this information because when is this process not fast enough 
or too fast, that puzzles me and that has puzzled the scientific community, especially in this pandemic. What we do have is a very good explanation, very logical and true, about why was the vaccine developed so fast. First, it was a global effort. Never in the history of humankind has so many people gotten together uh, so fast worldwide to work on a single topic. And this was the development of a vaccine for COVID-19. The amount of information that was developed was enormous. The usual process to develop a vaccine is in tandem. So there are several stages that are developed one after the other, and sometimes there is a lag of time between one stage and another stage because there is no pressure, there is no urgency to develop the vaccines at least not a relative urgency or not a real urgency. But also because each one of these stages require an enormous amount of people not only working on the vaccine and working on the fabrication and production of the vaccine, but people that volunteer so we can test the vaccine upon them. In this case, there was a huge amount of financial support for a single disease to support any platform, any type of vaccine development technique worldwide. And because of the huge awareness and the emergency and the disruption in, in life, we got an unprecedented amount of volunteers very, very fast for the vaccine. So it took only a few months to recruit tens of thousands of individuals for each one of the trials worldwide, which usually would have taken several years to do so in regular circumstances. So put it together, timelines, the willingness of governments to approve quickly and to not cut corners and not supersede steps that were needed to go through steps quicker than usual, not waste time, amount of financial investment, and amount of people willing to volunteer determined that the vaccine came in record time, as we have seen. So basically, in a summary, this is a, this is a slide that I took uh, from GSK uh, that explains very well and in a very simple form that with the ability of the internet access to information that had been or have been generated uh, at, at, at an enormous speed globally, we were able to put together teams of people worldwide and synthesize the, 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 the gene uh, by learning use any of the three means that I have explained to produce and work on the vaccines. The next question is why should I get vaccinated? The answer are very simple. Number one, to protect myself. So the vaccine is right now the only means to prevent you from getting infected. Of course, if you get infected, you will gain some level of immunity. We still do not know exactly what is the level, the expand, the extent, and the duration of that immunity. Same for the vaccine. We still have a lot of information that are coming as we walk the walk. However, we know that the vaccine develops immunity. That immunity protects you from getting infected even for the first time. And then through that, it protects your family and it protects everybody else. It will keep uh, everyone safe, uh, especially those that are in contact for you. It will help stop the spread of COVID-19. What is important is that those in contact with you, if they are of high risk and very susceptible to very severe course of the disease, 
are going to be greatly protected if you use the vaccine because you are going to be prevented from getting the disease in the first time. That does not mean, as I will explain later in more extent, that you should not keep using uh, the same precautions. But it means that because you are less likely to get the disease, you are less likely to spread it to others. Remember that the disease is spread mostly and uncontrollably through the asymptomatic people or through those that develop mild symptoms to the point that they are still in contact with people while they're being infecting uh, them or where they are infective. And at the end, well, we all hope that by the massive distribution of vaccines and increasing the level of immune people in the world, we will attain the amount of people that we need to attain to stop the pandemic and, uh, and get COVID disease as an endemic um, disease, which is what happens with other diseases. We just get a regional or local outbreaks at some points in time, but we don't get a pandemic of this nature. The next questions are related to the process of developing the vaccine and testing it before distribution, which is, uh, are the vaccines safe and are the vaccines effective? So the first point that is important because it's part of the sources of misinformation is that no vaccine will give you COVID-19, okay? So we are not injecting you with a virus that can give you the disease. Even when we use uh, viral particles or inactivated viruses, these cannot give you the disease, much less with the protein vaccines, much less with the uh, messenger RNA vaccines. Safety has been the most important priority in vaccine approval. So every vaccine that has been approved has been required to provide information on the trials and on the uh, secondary effects of the trials and on the safety overall of the whole vaccine administration during the trial. There were no corners cut in the trials done so far and reported so far. And they have been monitored as they should have been by independent bodies that are vigilant of the data quality, the quality of the trial, and the quality of the reporting of those effects that have to do with safety among other things. Most side effects we know now are minor. At the level of vaccination attained so far of that are now are going to quickly be counted in the hundreds of thousands of individuals, the amount of serious side effects has been minimum. Most of the side effects are a result of the vaccine working, producing immunity, which are a minor fever, minor malaise, very, uh, of very short duration, uh, local pain, uh, local swelling or rash. And those are common to many of the vaccines that we give uh, with, with, uh, safely throughout the world. Uh, Long-term monitoring, nonetheless, is on the way as the vaccination process progresses. And the purpose of this long-term vigilance of the vaccine effects is to precisely see if there are long-term effects of the vaccine. There are very few of those described for other vaccines. So what we know is that if you do not get any reaction of the serious kind immediately is very unlikely that we're going to get anything severe compared to the number of people vaccinated um, worldwide for any condition that has vaccines as a preventive measure. The COVID-19 trials have currently included when only about 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 individuals are usually needed they have included about 10 times more, 30,000, 40,000 participants. 
and the safety of the vaccine has been good. On the side of the effectiveness, it has been good as well. So you're going to start to see the raise on the numbers by the different types of vaccine and the different pharmaceutical companies that put them out. Because that, of course, is the nature of the competitiveness of these companies. However, the baseline is that a vaccine is usually approved for massive use in population, when it proves to avoid about half of the cases of the disease or more. And so far, the reports for COVID-19 vaccines have been of an effectiveness of 85 to 95% after two doses, when two doses are indicated, and most of them are two dose vaccines. So that means that not only we have achieved the prevention of half of the cases, but we have achieved the prevention of 85 to 95 percent of the cases. You will see some reports of scientists that say that this has not been proven in the trials because the production of antibodies by the vaccine is just a a uh, wrongful way to measure the response of the vaccine and the immunity. Well, that has not been the case. What these trials have reported is not only the production of antibodies in most vaccinated people, but they have proven that the number of cases that were produced in the group of control of the vaccines was about 20 times to 15 times larger than in the group that had the vaccine. And that is an 85 to 95 real prevention rate of cases of COVID-19 by the vaccination process. Uh, this is a summary table that you can solve. I apologize because I did not have enough time to translate it. Uh, however, the information is such that you will be able to understand it uh, quite easily. And it has the vaccines that are on the approval and use way now, and what we know about them in each one of the cases. So it's for your own use. So for the remaining of the questions, practical questions, uh, I go in this list, um, uh, I go through this list uh, to answer them. On the first one in this page, I got COVID-19. Uh, should I get the vaccine? The answer is yes. Everybody that got COVID-19 will probably be asked to uh, remain three months uh, without attempting to schedule an appointment for a vaccine. And then after three months, you, would, you, you could get the vaccine. But the overall consensus is that you will benefit, even if you got COVID-19, of the vaccination process, as we know now that the reaction to the disease and the immunity that the disease produces naturally is very, it varies very widely in range. So yes, you need to get the vaccine. It's better if you get the vaccine, even if you got the disease. Will I be immune if I get the vaccine? The answer is mostly yes. Why? Because the vaccines prove to be effective in 85 to 95% of the times. No vaccine is 100% effective. So you need to be aware that even if you get the vaccine, you have a small chance of getting the disease. Some people are testing themselves through the production of antibodies as a further uh, way to try to determine if the vaccine that they receive uh, was uh, produced an immune reaction. Albeit this is an option, it has not been the recommendation except when the vaccine was part of a study and we needed to learn about the antibody production by the vaccine. So it is not a, it, it probably, if you want to be tested for antibodies and, 
and, and, and determine if you got a positive production of antibodies to the vaccine, you will have to pay for the test yourself. Um, even if you develop immunity, immunity, you, might, you could transmit the virus. So be very careful, especially with those persons at high risk, as I mentioned to you before, because you might, you, you might transmit the, the virus to them um, because of your contacts with external people or infected people that you're not aware of. So the use of PPE and keeping social distancing is still recommended even if you got the vaccine and you can prove immune. How long will the immunity last? Well, we don't know. Uh, we are following up people that have been vaccinated and those that were vaccinated first as, their, uh, as, as the result of their participation in the trials to try to learn more about long-term immunity. But the main element to, to know about long-term immunity is not to know and do the proper testing, but is to actually have the time span to be able to conclude that, that after a year, we do have still immunity produced by the vaccine. Nonetheless, what we know now is that COVID-19 mutates, and you have seen recently that there are new mutations that actually uh, cause that the virus behaves differently. Fortunately, it seems that so far the vaccine is still effective amongst, uh, against those uh, mutations However, we expect that in the same way as influenza, we will need to vaccinate and develop uh, slightly changed uh, vaccines for different types of COVID-19 virus. Uh, will I need to get vaccine again? And if so, when? As I mentioned to you before, is related to the previous question, which is uh, most likely yes. So, so we anticipate that this virus is going to stay. The longer it stays and the more that it gets transmitted from one person to another, the more it mutates. And the more likely that one of those mutations is going to, uh, to change the response that the vaccine produces through the immune system to uh, avoiding the virus and the disease in persons. So maybe one of these mutations is going to cause that one of these viruses is no longer responsive to this vaccine and a new vaccine will need to be developed. The good thing is now we can develop that with the same platforms quite quickly and quite swiftly. So expect as for influenza, flu shots that are different every year and that need to be administered every year. Uh, should I use PPE if I get the vaccine? If so, why? So remember that the transmission of infected people um, is produced through the air, through particles, and through direct contact. So even if you do not get the virus and you do not replicate it in a way that infected people do, you can still transmit COVID-19. So be very, very careful on the use of masks and washing your hands and social distances, which are the three main measures to control so far the transmission of the disease, because uh, that is going to be very important, especially if you're in contact with elderly population of population that is at risk, such as those that have other comorbidities present like pulmonary disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, etc., that are more propensed to severe causes of disease. Uh, and for health workers, even if they are vaccinated, full protection is recommended so far. So the answer to this question is yes, you should keep using PPE, you should keep social distancing, even though you are protected, but especially be very careful with those that you're in contact with that are of high risk groups because they might get infected easier or quicker or faster, especially with the new strains of viruses. So, uh, as I always say, uh, during my CEC tenure, uh, all, all emergencies present with opportunities and secondary gain. And in this case, the development of the vaccines and learning quickly on the response to a vaccine was actually one of the good things of the pandemic. So please try to communicate the message that 
um, that the, the development of these vaccines has a logical explanation on why it was so fast. Number two, that we need to use the vaccines. Here in the UEA, we have the collaboration or in collaboration with Sinopharm, one of the first, probably the first uh, vaccination program that cover a substantial part of the population and it keeps on going. So that is very, very, very good. Um, still, you need to focus on the important and, and the essential and is that the virus is still there. Most of the population is still susceptible. So most of the population still might get infected. Even if uh, you get vaccinated, you can still transmit and help in the transmission of the virus. So just be careful, do what you have been doing for such a long uh, time, uh, you know, a year now, um, and, and act upon it because we can still control the transmission and the infectiveness of those that are remain at risk to be infected by COVID-19. So uh, here, the vaccine programs have tested the leadership, it tests all the chain, it tests your own discipline to accept information, filter misinformation, and become tolerant to the limitations of the system in such dire circumstances. Uh, there have been redirection of resources, uh, increased research and innovation, uh, uh, virtual platforms and means of communication that are accessed, that are accessible, and of course, you can access. Uh, the internet because it's going to help you a lot. The clinical vaccine challenges for the programs are keeping up to date on the rapidly development of information. We are learning while we are running and we anticipate that there is going to be globally a high level of vaccine rejection, which now know is as high as 30% in many places. However, fortunately is not the case of the UAE, Albeit, there are still people uh, here locally that believe the misinformation available for the vaccine and they do not want to use the advantages that the government in the UAE is putting to the service of the people, which is one of the best uh, programs in COVID-19 vaccination that exists in the world. So we need to produce information and knowledge that is accurate, not that is misinformation. And of course, we need to keep doing, you know, the testing, keeping health workers safe, keeping high risk people safe. We're going to have to face shortage of dosage uh, because then again, doses and, and dosage for these vaccine are not just yet being developed in a way that they can cover all of the population. And we need to also work on the prediction of future peaks and preparedness for especially the new mutations of COVID-19 virus, especially if those will affect the current use of the current vaccines that are available. So the take home messages that I want to leave for you and that I would like you to pass along to others is number one, that the vaccine is safe. Number two, vaccine is effective. Number three, the vaccine does not replace common sense and current management to avoid or mitigate the spread of the disease. Number four, vaccines can help protect the community. That is a fact and it is the only way that we can return to some level of normality of the pre-COVID-19 pandemic times. The vaccines are the subject of misinformation and it's very important that you access good sites and you trust your immediate healthcare provider for accurate information on the vaccines, the vaccine status, the vaccine safety, and especially the safety long term, that is the new information that is gonna come. But more importantly, when will you need to be vaccinated again? So <clears throat> we hope that we can vaccinate everybody within the next year. So when we need to start vaccinating again, those that we vaccinated at the beginning, we're gonna be ready. Because universal vaccination will not happen soon. We, we do not have enough vaccine right now, but it's being produced. 
So now that we know that it's safe, that it's effective, that it's uh, helpful, and that it avoids COVID-19 in 85 to 95% of the cases, we need to develop more vaccines. So we need to put accessibility to the vaccine in the hands of the people so that people can get vaccinated. And of course, as in any uh, urgent situation, especially learn from wars, unfortunately, academic and technological innovation gain is huge. So these are a few sites, WHO and CDC, where you can get really, really good information, but these are not the only ones. This is just some of the ones that are available. And remember, please, that COVID-19 said this a year ago. This is my new world. Yours will never be the same. So make vaccine part of everybody's life, vaccine information, part of everybody's communication and accurate information, and be willing to have the vaccine and promote it so we can actually recover from this world that COVID-19 took about a year ago and that it has not returned to us so far. So uh, with this, I want to end my presentation and I encourage you please to go into uh, writing some of the questions and answers that you might have. And I will uh, certainly try my best to give uh, answers to you as soon as possible, uh, I believe through the same media. So for now, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you listening to this presentation, to the efforts of Khalifa University to put accurate and timely information out there through this set of seminars. And I encourage you to see my peer seminars on other aspects of COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you.